In this video, I am going to be telling you all about the RPG rule set, which is Mithras. No idea what it is, but want to know more? Well, just keep watching then. You never know, you might just like it. My name's Inwills, and welcome to the In Crowd. So before we get going on explaining more about Mithras, I would like to ask you a question. What is your favorite rule set or which one do you play the most? Please do let me know in the comments down below. So in this video, I'm going to give you an overview of the Mithras rule set. So just so you know, Mithras is a fancy role playing game that shares many of the same elements as other fancy role playing games, such as Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Now with each area I cover later on in this series, I'm hopefully going to expand on these and provide some examples from our own um, gaming sessions for you to enjoy. So Mithras is based on a D100 percentile dice system. Other dice are used, for example, for hit location and damage, but really and truly the dice that are used the majority of the time are used to generate a number between one and 100. So basically within Mithras, there are no classes. So it's not a case of choosing to be a fighter or magic user or anything like that. And um, players choose from a range of cultural and professions um, in which they can learn specific skills. And these skills um, allow people to interact with the campaign. Now, there is magic, um, however, everybody can use magic if they want to put the appropriate time and skills into it. Although some backgrounds or professions do come quite naturally with the magic skill and they're able to cast spells, while others are more focused within combat. There are also some very important skills around, um, which include things like brawn and endurance and willpower, but I'll talk more about those in the skills video. So like most role-playing games, um, Mithras has a range of characteristics. Um, other games might call these ability scores. Um, characteristics range from strength through size and dexterity up to power and charisma. Um, separate dice are rolled from either um, 3d6s or 2d6s plus 6 for each of these characteristics and they give the basic um, outline of the character. Now from these characteristics there are attributes and attributes are um, sort of like major components of the game that the player and character will use in order to interact with the campaign. For example, um, action points um, are derived from characteristics and these include how many times the character can act per round. More about that later on. There's other things in um, attributes as well, such as damage modifiers, luck points, more about that later on, and things like experience modifiers and movement. So the players can allocate either initial skill points in character generation or later on within the game experience points in order to develop the skills. The skills range from um, things like perception right there up to reading and writing. Now these are rolled throughout the game um, to a difficulty rating. For example, a task might be very easy or a task might be formidable. And if a character has a skill in perception, say for for example of 76 they roll a percentile dice and if they generally get below 76 they will be successful in the attempt at a chosen skill now to add a bit of depth to the characters they can also have something called passions. Now these are something that the player might gather throughout the campaign world or they might have when they initially start uh, in character generation. But basically a passion is exactly what it states. It is something that the um, character is 
passionate about. And these roles um, can be used to augment other skills. For example, if my character had a passion against um, an enemy tribe or a tribe of bandits that it's been encountering over and over again, it might be wanting to actually um, re take some vengeful action on them. And if I had a passion for this, then I can augment my skill well when in combat with them by adding a fraction of my passion to my dice rolls, so making them a lot easier in that situation to succeed in. Now, part of the skills that every character has, and they choose this at character generation, uh, is what's called a combat style. Now, in my campaign, a combat style is related to the use of three weapons. So characters are in, uh, encouraged to create their own combat styles. So for example, somebody who's grown up on the street might have a combat style of um, that includes things like throwing stones or objects, daggers, and maybe even a slingshot. And these are generally brought together underneath a title for the combat style, for example, Street Urchin. And then essentially the character can use all the weapons within that combat style um, with the same percentile chance to hit. Um, other weapons that they can use, they can either gain in training um, in between adventures, or they can pick up a similar um, weapon, for example, instead of throwing a stone, it might be a glass bottle and still throwing it. And I might say, yes, you can use your combat style for that. Alternatively, I might say, hmm, that's not quite the same. So the difficulty rating has gone up from, um, say, standard to hard. Now, let's talk a little bit about combat. So combat is based on initiative, um, which is a basic role. And then we have a number of rounds and with each, in ra each round there are turns. And the characters can use what's known as action points to take actions within each turn. Now, when combat actually um, happens, it is based on participants attacking and parrying and evading roles. Now, I'll go more into combat when I, in a longer video, but basically, the characters choose whether or not to attack, whether or not to parry or, or evade, i.e. roll out the way. And then according to the dice rolls, they can gain combat specials such as bleed, um, impale, or choose location. And these can be used to cause more damage or um, to hit certain locations of the body. Now, as well as having armor points on each hit location, characters have a certain amount of hit points allocated to each location. So they do not have a global overall hit point allocation, for example, of 104. They have very specific hit points allocated to each of the um, hit points hit locations. The important thing about this is that it's very hard to increase natural characteristics um, within the game. So these are basically there forever. So a character might start off, say, with four points of uh, hit points on their arm, and this will not change, you know, even when um, fighting between um, a thug and a great dragon, the character still has four hit locations on that hit points on that hit location. Now, as you can imagine, with um, very specific hit locations in each area, armor becomes very important. If you say, for example, have six points in an area, then any damage that you take between six and zero will be classed as a minor wound. After that, you get a serious wound. And after that, you get a major wound. Now, because of this, um, certain amounts of damage um, up to uh, a major wound can actually cut off a limb or mangle it or even decapitate you in one shot. So as you can imagine, helmets and shields are very popular within Mithras. 
Now, for all you magic spell wielding um, players, are, is there any magic in Mithras? Well, first of all, yes, there is. And the system allows you to include and develop the magic system however you wish to do it. Um, one of the basic characteristic uh, attributes sorry, is magic points, and magic points act like the power to fuel the spells. Then generally, there are several areas of magic and um, folk magic magic which are a bit like cantrips everybody can have them as long as you have a folk magic skill but they're very basic and they don't do a whole lot of damage but they are quite useful you then have thesists which are like the clerics who um, can do things like miracles um, which are sort of like powerful devotion spells like calling down the wrath of their god you have animists who deal with the spirits of the world the undead spirits and you have mystics who are a bit like um mythical monks they can um, summon up power to make themselves more combat efficient or um, be better with weapons etc and then finally you have the deadly sorcerers who actually control a very very powerful magic that can actually kill people with one spell now as i previously mentioned there are no levels in um, Mithras at all. You don't gain experience points and then increase to second level and all your skills go up. You do have experience points that you can use to develop individual skills, but the other option is to join a brotherhood, guild, cult, whatever you would like to call it. And within these groups of people, you can um, gain extra training and you can learn new spells, etc. So they're not actually compulsory at all. And you can actually play the game without them. However, it does add a lot of background and um, enjoyment um, as the players start to move up their brotherhoods or guilds and become more and more powerful. So that's basically a quick overview of Mithras. There are some optional game mechanics that you can use, um, although you don't have to. Um, encumbrance is very real within the game. I actually play it in our system. So you can't actually wear a whole load of armor um, because it will actually weigh you down and then you become more fatigued. More about that in a second. But wearing too much armor actually does slow down your movement and gives you what's known as a negative buoyancy roll so or value so basically if you have a negative buoyance um, score it means that once you went into water you sink very rapidly Another optional rule that we play with in our campaign is um, to do with fatigue. So generally, um, the more fatigued you get, the more tired you get, then the um, difficulty of the roles become harder and harder. It also impacts on your um, number of action points you have and your initiative dice, etc., etc. The more you physically exert yourself or the longer you are in combat, the more chance there is of you getting fatigued. Now you can play other races in Mithras. However, um, essentially my campaign, everybody, all the players are humans, but there are options for that if you would like to be an elf or a minotaur or even a halfling. So um, that gives you a quick overview of the um, rule set, which is Mithras. Now, if you have any questions about this, then please do um, put them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Um, I have to really say at this point that we've only been playing for under a year. So some of you experts out there might be thinking, he said that wrong. And that's absolutely right. Do put me correct in the comments. If you have any other questions, then please don't forget to like, comment or subscribe to this video. And then you will get this series of updates as I make new videos about the rule set. And remember that um, I would like to know what your favorite rule set is. So please add that in the comments below as well. So later on in this series, I'll be talking about combat in more depth, the power of magic and also character generation. So do tune in later on. Until then, I would just like to say to each and every one of you, please remember to be who you are and say what you think. 
because the people who mind don't matter and the people who matter don't mind. Have fun, guys, and I'll catch you all later. And until then, happy mythrassing. See ya. Bye. Pass protection on myself. Okay, cool. Yeah. And yeah. I'm going to use a point of luck. Uh, yeah, to reverse it, which will um, do it. So, yeah, you um, will cast um, your um, protection. Let me just pop it on for you so we know that you've got it on. Uh, there you go. Um, excellent. So that's um, um, Bartaby um, spellcasting. Yeah, um, Hengist, you're up. You're muted, Hengist. Ta. Seeing this spider um, scuttling towards him, so like using the walls as well, Hengist will sort of have settled into his combat stance. And as soon as he gets within striking distance, he's going to um, do a, a big swing of his, of his sword. Yeah, so there'd be an attack. Um, yeah, that 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 hits. Um, just let's um, see what this um, beast does. Yeah, it, it tries to sort of as you swipe at it, it tries to almost like manage to try to get out the way, um, using its legs as leverage to um, try to avoid it. But um, it 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 misses. Um, it doesn't quite get out of way, and you actually catch it. Um, as as you um, hit it, so you will have um, one special as well. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can use something different that I don't normally use. Um... You'll end up using play, just use it. <laughs> no, I don't want to use it. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to. Um... Use the force. Um, Hengus will use lead. <laughs> no, I'm okay. I'm joking. Hengus, Hengus is going to lunge into this thing, so he's going to use impale. Oh. Okay, then. Um, yeah, so I, I need a, a location to sort of roll 120, please, because obviously it's not a humanoid um, creature. 120. Um, 19 yeah so you you actually um, catch it on a part of its um, thorax um, okay. what's that um, the, the front part of the um, oh. um, spiders only have two parts of the bodies because they're arachnids I thought it was his throat no uh, it's just sort of like it's um, front body yeah um, 10 damage uh, are you impaling oh yeah sorry I have to do two don't I take less sorry Take the first one, please. Um, yeah, so that's um, two points of dam, ten points of damage. Sorry on on that. So yeah, so you um, whack um, your your sword down, and it sort of like splits through the chitin um, outer shell, and sort of like plummets um, down into the uh, into the actual spider. Um, duh, 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 duh. Let's do 